Okay, so George asked me to talk about um, how we use data-driven methods in climate modeling. And I'll talk about um, a project I'm leading, which is called the Climate Modeling Alliance. Uh, what we want to do is essentially build a, a climate model that's much better than previous climate models, computationally more advanced, and uses data more extensively. So what we are, we are, we are a group of people coming from applied math, computer science, from atmospheric science, oceanography, the earth sciences, and a bunch of engineers, primarily at Caltech. It's a group at MIT working on an ocean model, and a group at the Naval Postgraduate School. And then there's a group at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory up the hill here that's um, building a land model. So we're building the first earth system model that, that is to automatically learn from diverse data sources to produce more accurate climate predictions with quantified uncertainties. And I'll tell you about how we do this. We're primarily funded by... Um, our primary funder is Eric and, or Eric and Bendy Schmidt, and there's a bunch of other private foundations, and uh, there's a software institute grant from the National Science Foundation that's behind all of that. So let me tell you about uh, limitations of current climate models and how we think we can overcome them. If you look at temperature change over the last 150 years, this is the mean temperature increase since the 1850s until a few years ago. Gray areas are just areas where there isn't enough data, and what you see is Earth has warmed everywhere. It's truly global warming. Continents have warmed more than oceans for reasons we understand, having to do not as you might suspect, suspect with the lower heat capacity of continents relative to oceans, but more to do with um, there being limited water available to evaporate over continents relative to oceans. So you expect continents to warm faster, and they have. You expect high latitudes to warm faster, and they have. If you put some numbers to it, if you, for example, look over for parts of um, northern Canada or Alaska, you have warming of four or five degrees in the mean already in winter even more. And it's, it's, these are truly large changes that already are observable. Of course, the question is what will happen in the future, and there things get a bit murky. Um, here is what current climate models tell you when you ask them a what should be a relatively simple question. You've heard about the Paris Agreement. 196 countries agreed that warming should be limited to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Apparently, it's not 195 countries, but in any case. Um, that was relative to pre-industrial levels. We had about 1 degree warming in the global mean so far, so there's about 1 degree more to go. And now you can just take the climate models we have. There are 29 models that, that went into the last IPCC report and ask them how much more CO2 can you put into the atmosphere to get this additional degree of warming. We have currently 415 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and some models would suggest that at something like 480 parts per million, you have crossed this two degree threshold, so one more degree of warming. And another models suggest, well, you can go almost to 600 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. And if these numbers are not all that intuitive to you, you can try to translate this into time. So 480 parts per million we'll reach within the next 20 years, irrespective of policy interventions and whatever might happen, that will just happen. Whereas even under high emission trajectories, 600 parts per million we won't reach before 2060 or so, perhaps even later. The models here are ordered, so each bar is one model, and they're ordered in order of increasing climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is the metric we use to say, how much warming does a model produce once you double the CO2 concentration and let it equilibrate? And the main difference between the more sensitive models that warm faster, so where this two degree threshold, for example, would be crossed sooner, and the less sensitive models on the left here that warm more slowly is how they deal with clouds and especially with low clouds over tropical oceans. So low clouds, these are the clouds, for example, this morning, stratocumulus clouds coming from the ocean over land here giving us June gloom, May gray, and the like in this area. In general, there are vast areas of tropical oceans covered by clouds. So what it looks like when you take off from LAX, look down, pretty much year-round, there's this white blanket over the ocean, the stratocumulus clouds. It's just a white cloud over the dark ocean, so they reflect sunlight, they cool the Earth underneath. If you, uh, say, fly to the Hawaiian Islands, as I suppose many of you do for observing, for example, or surfing, um, this is what it looks like. You have just dark ocean surface exposed and cumulus clouds around for the most part. So they're much more scattered clouds. And as a result, it's warmer underneath because more sunlight is absorbed at the ocean surface. The dark ocean surface is exposed. And what we don't know is if you get more stratocumulus cloud as the climate warms, more cumulus clouds, neither of these climate models produce wildly different answers. And the models that 
produce more warming tend to produce fewer of these low clouds that then amplifies the warming because there's more dark ocean exposed. And the models that produce less warming tend to produce more of these low clouds that reflect some sunlight and dampen the warming. And fundamentally, we just don't know which, if any of those, are right. What you could do, if you could get better predictions, I mean, they have enormous practical value. I think we are at a stage where they have enormous economic value. Cities are planning seawalls. New York City, for example, is spending close to a billion dollars on the seawall. They would like to know how high to build the seawall so that the city is protected against, say, what might be a 100-year flood 30 or 40 years from now. You just like to know what that 100-year flood, so there's 1% probability of a flood, would be um, a few decades from now. And right now, we can't give accurate estimates of that, either a point estimates or, or confidence intervals. You'd like to, in general, know what kind of water management infrastructure you'd like to put into the ground. It stays there for decades, and um, you'd like to plan for it, storm drains and the like. And we don't have good information for planning for infrastructure, for example. Economic value of better predictions, you can put numbers on it in various ways. Um, United Nations estimates that climate change adaptation will cost something like $200 billion a year by 2050. Um, there are estimates of what the economic value would be of reducing uncertainties in climate predictions, such as the one I showed you, by a factor of two within 10 years. And the number of people came up there is less than a trillions of dollars. They came up with very precise numbers, 10 trillion, 2005 US dollars. Now, how precise that is, I don't know, but it, it's big numbers. Um, so the point is, we need better information and we need it fast, because the information we provide to society is a strongly declining function of time. The experiment out there is happening. At some point, the modeling won't be as valuable anymore. Um, so why, why are these clouds hard? And there are many other processes that, are, that cause uncertainties, but clouds are more than half of the uncertainties we have in climate predictions. Various ways of looking at it. One easy way of saying why clouds are hard is that climate models have 10 to 50 kilometers horizontal resolution typically now. Cloud scales are meters, tens of meters, maybe 100 meters. So this is orders of magnitude away from what you need to resolve them. We know the equations of motion governing the clouds, laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws of motion. We can write them down. It's a beautiful set of seven differential equations. We just can't resolve it globally. Um, before I started this research a number of years ago, and I calculated how big a computer you would need to, to be able to resolve these clouds explicitly. just want to make sure I'm not becoming redundant because someone comes up with a fast computer. The answer is you need a computer 10 to 11 times faster than the fastest we currently have. It's not going to happen anytime soon. So you need to be clever instead. That's an example of how models do poorly with clouds. Here is the, the black line shows observations of cloud cover. This is off the coast of South America. It looks very similar off the coast of California, for example. You have this 70%, in this case, stratocumulus cloud cover year-round. This is what climate models do that have this information available. They underestimate the cloud cover by factor two or three. So they underestimate the reflection of sunlight in those areas. As a result, the ocean underneath is too warm. Here's the surface temperature, black observed colors are the, the models. And the models generally are too warm because they have too few clouds. Um, the, the bias is well known. It has a name. It's called the too few, too bright bias. There are too few, few clouds, and they are too bright, somewhat artificially made per unit cloud, a little bit brighter that your energetic biases don't get as bad as they otherwise would be. This is from, from a paper in 2004 by Linnetal. It's cut off at the bottom there. Um, it's a well-known issue. There's one example of there are biases in models. We know about the biases. We have data to see them. And the question for us is, how can we use the data to reduce biases and get models with better predictive capabilities? So what we wanted to do is build, build a model that learns from diverse data sources. So the way data have been used in climate modeling is more or less like in the slide I showed you before. Did you run a climate model, you hold it next to the data and say, oh gosh, it looks bad, or some parts look good, but often there are deficiencies. The, the data are primarily used for model evaluation. There's some use of data in, in model development, but it's very limited. So what we wanted to do is use all the data we have, and it's massive amounts, um, broadly and massively in the model development process in itself. And there are two sources of data from which you can learn. Either observations, most of them are space-based. I'll come say a word about what they are. For example, we have observation of temperature, cloud cover in the atmosphere, and the like. 
some for several decades, cloud cover for about 13 years now with global coverage. And as I mentioned, we can, we can write down the equations governing clouds, and we can solve them, just not on a globe. We can do it in a limited area, so we can generate data computationally. And using both sources together, I think, is the key to, to success here. So space-based data we have, or data, observational data more generally, most of them are space-based, but there's also data available from the ground or from autonomous vehicles in the oceans, for example. Here is what's known as the A-Train, the Afternoon Constellation of Satellites, uh, a bunch of them operated by JPL and a bunch of them invented at Caltech, OCO2 measuring carbon dioxide and photosynthesis out front, there's Calypso, CloudSat measuring clouds from space with radar and LiDAR. These satellites have been providing data, massive amounts, and the potential of these data to improve models really hasn't been tapped. And the other source of data, if you want to call it that, are, are simulations. This is a high-resolution simulation of a tropical cumulus cloud field that we did. This is replicating an observational field campaign, an aircraft campaign. Blue is rain, gray is clouds. The colors are buoyancy, effectively temperature at the surface. And well, okay, they look pretty, but we can compare it against the aircraft data. These are good simulations. We can validate the simulations well against um, data we have. So we can simulate, for example, clouds and other small-scale processes that cause uncertainties in climate models quite accurately, just not globally. This is a limited domain. So in this case, the domain size is maybe about 5 kilometers on the side. So 5, 10 kilometers, that, that kind of domain size we can do quite easily now. So what you can do is that you can nest limited area models, like what I showed you on the right is an example of another uh, simulation of tropical cumulus clouds. You can nest them in selected grid columns or smaller areas of a global model. You can do it in one column, but you can do it in many, in thousands. We're working on a, on a project right now with Google where we have 20,000 of these simulations embedded in a global model. So this is massive computation yielding large amounts of data that then we can use to inform what the large scale, the coarse grained model does, for example, about clouds. So what you need there is a way of interpolating the data that you generate in limited areas to spread it to the rest of the globe. What we do there is use physical models, but have these physical models learn from data in written ways I'll describe. Um, the key here is that when you talk about climate is that you want to predict statistics of weather, various statistics, averages, extreme values, and the like. And hence it makes sense to optimize your model over statistics that you accumulate in time. These statistics can be first moments, so that means if you minimize mismatches in first moments between what you simulate and observe, <clears throat> that means you minimize biases. Uh, biases in temperature, biases in cloud cover, and the like. But you can do this for any statistic. You can do it for covariances. You can do it for any higher order statistic. Precipitation extremes is something that many care about. Predicting well, you can make that a target in the model optimization directly. Here's just an example of, of biases, other biases in models that you can, that we know they are there and that you can target for minimization. This is the Arctic temperature. So black is observations again. Colors are all the climate models. This is temperature averaged everywhere north of 60 degrees in this case. And um, observations here, and the colors are the models. And so you see the bias a bit better. This is just the, what the models do minus observations. You see some models have biases as large as 10 degrees. Well, let's say this is an outlier. It looks very funny. But you know, 4 or 5 degrees is not unusual for a bias in models. If you think about the Arctic, one of the things you like to predict is sea ice cover. Uh, sea ice has a threshold nonlinearity. It freezes below freezing. And if you have a temperature bias of a few degrees that can lead to large biases in sea ice cover, models tend to be too cold in winter. They tend to simulate too much sea ice. They tend to be too cold because they have difficulty with simulating turbulence in a stable boundary layer well. And this is one obvious target for improving models. Um, instead of saying, well, these biases are large and that's too bad, you can directly use data-driven approaches to try to minimize those biases. And here's one thing that makes this problem maybe a little bit different, say, from learning from image data sets that have been, have been tagged. In the end, what we want to do is predict something we haven't seen. We want to predict a climate for which we don't have data. We can still run high-resolution simulations for some aspects of it, 
but we don't have observational data to ground truth it. So we need good out-of-sample predictive capabilities. We need good generalization properties. And what this means for us is, well, probably we don't want to use, say, represent clouds by a deep neural network, but we want to use the known equations of motion to the extent possible. And then it has several advantages, minimizes the number of adjustable parameters, and avoids overfitting and the like. Wait, you said five minutes? I started well after two, but OK. Um, OK, I don't think I had 20 minutes, but all right. Um, a challenge. A challenge in this is that once you optimize over statistics, um, you need to each forward model evaluation is say long enough that you can accumulate these statistics. That might be a season, and that's that's expensive to do. The models here are extremely expensive, so you need to find ways of doing that with a minimal number of forward model evaluations. Um, Okay, since someone tells me it's five minutes, we have equations of motion. Just to say, these are PDEs, there are parameters in them, parametric functions you like to estimate. Let's not worry about what they are. Um, what we're doing is we're building a model that has, it's an Earth system model with fairly traditional components, atmosphere, ocean, land, and the like. And wrapped around it is a layer for data assimilation, machine learning, through which the observational data can be assimilated, through which data generated computationally can be assimilated. And this model is able to spin off, say, high resolution simulations on the fly um, to generate this data. Now, I want to say a few words about how we do this and do this faster than planned. I really think I started at 207, by the way, but anyway. Um, we. So what we do is we accumulate over statistics. So you end, up, you end up with an objective function that might look somewhat like that, where here's some sort of time average that's long compared to the time scale over which the atmosphere forgets its initial conditions. You minimize an objective function that's an L2 norm of some function f. I'll say something about it in a, in a minute. That contains time averages. And here's something that's observational data. Here's something you simulate. You minimize the mismatches between the two. And f might is a moment function that, for example, can contain first moment statistics, second moment, or any higher or moment statistic that you like. And it's nice to minimize such a function because statistics tend to be quite smooth. The downside is evaluating it is expensive. And we have, I think, a nice way of doing that very rapidly. I mean, a standard approach to doing that would be Bayesian calibration with Markov chain Monte Carlo. It needs hundreds of thousands to millions of function evaluations. Completely not feasible here. So with Andrew Stewart here, and a number of students, two of them, students postdocs together, Emmett and Alfredo, two of them, we found a way that works fast and well. And let me just say, here's a simple climate model that has, in this case, just two parameters. And we don't need to worry about what they are. One is a time scale, two hours, and one is a relative humidity, 70% being the true values. And what we wanted to do here is artificially generate data with this model. So use a perfect model setting where you just run the model with the true parameters we know, add some noise to the output, call that data, and then try to re-estimate the parameters. And there are three steps that make this successful and um, fast. The first step is a calibration step where we use variants of ensemble common inversion. So what you have here is 100 points, an ensemble of size 100, in this two-dimensional parameter space with this time scale parameter where the true value is two hours and the relative humidity parameter where the true value is 70%. There's an objective function that has various climate statistics in it, including precipitation extremes. And then we, um, we run a variant of common inversion, and you see this ensemble within a few iterations, five iterations or so, collapses to a point. So that point is close to the true value. That's good. But the ensemble collapses. That's bad because the ensemble contains no uncertainty information anymore. And you can sh prove in a linear case that in fact collapses to a point. So uncertainty information is lost. Optimization is rapid and good. So the idea then was, well, this is 
the ensemble of size 100, five iterations, so you have 500 function evaluations of a climate model, you can use them to quantify uncertainties. So what we do is we train a Gaussian process in this case, and here you could use neural networks just as well, in this calibration step. So with these 500 training points that we have, we train a Gaussian process and that's sketched here. So you have some true function, a dash function, evaluated at some training points, the red dots. And what the Gaussian process does for you is estimate a smooth function that interpolates between these two and gives you uncertainty information that gets large, say, where you have no data to constrain it. And this is, this then gives you an emulator for a climate model, something you can evaluate a million times at virtually no, no cost, no computational cost. So we can do Markov chain Monte Carlo on the emulator. It's half a million iterations in this case. The black dots are the common ensemble we had before that collapsed ensemble. The colors are the, the posterior we get after the emulation. And suffice it to say, we can just brute force calculate the true uncertainty, and this is a good estimate of the true uncertainty in this problem. There is still a problem that this ensemble collapses. So what Alfredo, Andrew, and a few others have done since then is find a way of, a principled way of preventing this ensemble collapse by adding noise in ways that is consistent with the posterior information. Here's another example where this is done. This is a two-dimensional slice through a high-dimensional problem. And gray is a true posterior. And um, orange is the... Uh, it's, it's a brute force MCMC evaluation of the true posterior. And the green dots are this, what we now call the ensemble common sampler. So it's a variant of this common inversion that doesn't collapse. And you see the green dots sample the true posterior quite well. So if then you do the Gaussian process training on top of it, um, you, you are sampling the posterior well, and the Gaussian processes help you spread that information. Um, within the support of the posterior. So what this gives you is a calibration of, of a model and uncertainty quantification that's roughly a factor 1,000 faster than standard approaches, and that makes it feasible for, for climate models. And I would think, say, for astrophysics, you have many of the same problems. You have equations of motion. You have data. You like the data to calibrate the equations of motion or parameters in, in those equations. I would think similar approaches could work just as well there. So we're using these kind of approaches for calibration of a whole Earth system model and all of its components, atmosphere, land, ice, ocean, and the rest. And yeah, what we want to do within the next five years, build out a model that can spin off these nested high-resolution simulations, it can learn from observational data, it uses ideas from data assimilation, merged with some ideas from machine learning, Gaussian processes, or neural networks for uncertainty quantification. And ideally, what will grow around that is some ecosystem of applications where, say, you can uh, get detailed information for flood risk assessment, wildfire assessment, and the like. We are working together here at Caltech in, in, in a, the former Provo's residence has become our office. Um, what's nice is there are people from computer, computer science, applied math, atmospheric science, um, various domain-specific disciplines, software engineers. We're all in one space. And it it's really has tremendously increased the quality of our interactions and made our work much more effective jointly. And um, what's especially nice for students that they're broadly trained, we have now established links between graduate programs and computational applied math and environmental science that students truly see both sides of, of the story, which is something that was um, important to us and is importantly important for the students working with us because they're very excited about it. I'll stop right there and happy to take questions. <laughs>